Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive, where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And if this is your first time on the Hunt Primitive channel, do please consider subscribing because on this channel, I really focus hard on primitive build, how-to, and or hunting videos just like this one. And today, I'm going to teach you because I've had a lot of people request that I show how to make my bison skinner knife. Now, why do I call it a bison skinner? Because when we did the Atlatl and bison hunting documentary, this is what we almost exclusively used with the exception of some raw flakes to skin and process the bison. But what it is, is it is a double-edged primitive utility knife used for both animals and projects. Now, normally, the blade is a little bit wider and we're going to talk about this actually later on but this one's been sharpened down over a period of time because i use this thing all the time and i use it on everything i use it on wood on bone on antler on animals it is such a wonderful tool to use so follow along with us and we're going to teach you how to build a bison skinner just like this one just another note as we get started, if you are interested in a bison skinner and you don't want to make one, but I'm going to teach you how to make one, you can pick it up on my site huntprimitive.com and I will drop a link down in the description to that. But we're going to work on making it out of a piece of Buffalo River shirt. I figured that's just too suiting, isn't it? To make a bison skinner out of Buffalo River shirt. So this piece is not particularly pretty. It's a little bit pretty. There's a little bit of color in it but I just decided to choose kind of just a gray rock because to me it's a utility knife. I'm not going to use it for anything other than using and abusing, but most of this, not I would say 50% of the Buffalo River stuff is actually really pretty. So you got these reds and purples and yellow swirls and stuff going on, stuff like this here. These are just kind of arrowhead sized pieces, got speckles and swirls and they got a lot of color in it. And it's actually really, really cool rock, and this is stuff that's heat treated. And I do actually, at least at the moment, we'll see how long supplies last, if I continue to, to keep it or not, but I do offer this rock on my website as well. And again, I'll drop a link down in the description. And please forgive all my little ads, because you remember I'm self-sponsored. All this stuff I do, I try to share a lot of information, but everybody asks all the time where to get this stuff, so of course I'm going to let you know where. And we're going to be building all this with our primitive or aboriginal napping kit and that includes all these different tools but anyway we're going to go ahead and get on into the build so we're going to work on the on the blade first and then we'll work on the handle and if you've watched some of my other napping videos I've gone through the complete process of napping and if you want to see a complete process of napping with these abo tools I will drop a link down in the description for that as well. But also, because now we're getting so many links and so many videos, I have created a playlist that is going to be my Stone Age series playlist because, believe it or not, this is all coming to a head and there's going to be a great big finish at the end. So I made a playlist. I'll drop the playlist link down in the bottom and then you'll never miss if you always click on that playlist you'll always see every video that we ever add to it so definitely do that because we have a lot of, I mean a lot of really cool stuff coming up in the very near future so anyway let's go ahead and let's get to breaking some rock but I am going to skip through a little bit of the process on this one I forgot to kind of that's where I was heading with that I'm going to skip through a little bit of this so you can go watch that other video on napping a, a, a little hand knife that I did completely start to finish. So if you want the tutorials on how to do it, or if you want a tutorial start to finish on long, like a beginner's flint napping video, I have that too. Just got to check out my channel, Flint Napping for Beginners. Now, that being said, now let's get on to cracking some rock. All right, we're going to work through this nap a little bit different than we than I have on other ones because I want to show you a little bit more of an indigenous style of napping not so much focusing on sitting in a chair even though they could very easily sit on a log or a rock and nap like that as possible but I know that there's a lot of primitive culture that sits like this and of course I I do not possess the genetics to be able to sit flat-footed 
unfortunately. But <clears throat> I can lean up against here, and we're going to do a lot of sitting like this and working. And so hopefully you'll be able to grasp a concept a little bit more so of how primitive man would have probably been in a position to nap to make points and blades and such like that. So that's the reason that we're doing it in this manner. So first I'm going to be starting off with a little bit of hammerstone work. I've got my tools sitting here. Let me just kind of get comfortable into this. And what I may do, switch positions here with you a little bit. There we go. I think that's pretty good for now. You should be able to see a little bit of what's going on like this. And it's not actually terrible, terribly comfy for me to sit like this, but we're going to do it anyway. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of hammer stone just to do some rough spalling. Anything that I pull off like this to me, there's an arrowhead in that. A little arrowhead. I always save this stuff. Always. Unless it's something like this. It's just a little teeny tiny and curled and I can't get anything off of it. And then that's when I pitch them aside. But if I can use it like that, there's an arrowhead in that one. I'm going to save that one. And just kind of work right through with a hammer stone. And if you've seen before, when I operate a hammer stone, usually it's on my lap, just like this. And I'm holding it, obviously, like this as I'm working down. And if you need to know everything you need to know about, like, the angles and stuff, that's where the beginner flint napping video would come in really handy. This is not a, a breakdown of absolutely every angle that I'm hitting. I just want to show you what I'm starting with, what we're going to end with. We're going to skip through quite a bit of this in the in making the blade. But we'll show you some of it, especially getting started, some good highlights along the way. So if you've seen, you know, a lot of these other napping videos I do, they're they're very great tutorials on why I'm choosing the angles. There's a good flake right there. Why I'm choosing the angles that I'm hitting. And that's what the beginner's flint napping video is for. But we're not going to go through all of that. Really the focus of this is I want to show you a little bit of progression. Maybe a little bit of quick time lapse work. Nothing too fancy video editing wise. But just show you a little bit of the progression. What we started with. And our, our finished product blade. But I think... Moreover, you can go watch videos on me making points. So that's not the emphasis here. The emphasis is going to be mostly working through the handle and the attachment and talking about the knife. But I did really want to lead off with showing making some of the blade because inevitably some people are going to find this video that haven't seen my channel or haven't seen my napping videos and they're going to run right into well you skip I don't even know how you made that you skipped the whole part so because of that that's why I'm making mention that there's plenty of other videos that I've done to see in detail how I make these points or these blades or whatever it is that you're trying to make and that's kind of an interesting fact within itself, too, is a lot of these blades, we're going to talk about this a lot more later, especially in a different video, but it's really important stuff is, is like I said, that this one's already been narrowed down quite a bit, and that's because I've resharpened it over and over and over, and it was a lot more bolt-hung or rounded when I started, and now it's more lancelet-shaped, so it's actually starting to take on more the appearance of a projectile point rather than a knife blade but that's really anthropologically important because you, th you look at an artifact and say well look at the edge geometry or the tip geometry on this on this piece this was clearly made to be a projectile point and that's even the way that I thought about this for years until I started really working with these Stone Age tools and watching the progression of how they are made and how they are used and how they're sharpened 
and resharpened and how they change shape all the time. And it's so amazing to see the progression of them because if you found this without a handle and it was nothing but a point, you'd pick it up and say, that's an atlatl point. That's a, you know, it'd be a Dalton shape is essentially what we're shooting for. It's what's on the inside of this haft is a Dalton um, base. And you would say that it was a Dalton projectile point, which in reality, this has been used as nothing but a knife. So keep that in mind. Super, super, super interesting stuff as we move along. So can't always judge a book by its cover. Nice hammerstone work. Really, 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 really nice. This Buffalo River shirt is, is really, really nice stuff when it's, uh, I mean, even raw, it's actually really, really nice, but heat treated, it just gets a certain creaminess to it. We're just about getting it bifaced out here, you can see, right? So we're not completely there yet, but you can see that I've mostly worked all the way around it. I'm going to take a few more flakes off here. I'll spin it over. I'm going to build a platform, and I'm going to remove this part. In fact, it's probably what I'll just go ahead and do right now. So as you can see, it's mounted up. I haven't bifaced that side at all. So I'm going to batter this edge, the hammer stone. And again, if you've not seen that video, if you don't have all these tools that we're going to be using you can actually get them on my website but i know most people usually prefer to make their own aboriginal napping sets but i also am acutely aware that not everybody lives in a location in which they just have access to this material so if you are interested in it again you can find it on my website huntprimitive.com now let's get right there we go. Good one. Beauty. Right, we need one right here. A couple of them anyway. I'm kind of on my hammerstone game today. I'm doing a pretty pretty good job with it. Some rocks just work a little bit better with a hammerstone, some work better with antler. And if a tool is working for you, don't switch. Just use that tool until it's no longer doing what you want it to do, and then that's when you switch. So getting pretty close to actually switching because I know this is going to stop driving the flakes that I want to really soon. In fact, we're kind of starting that right now. We're starting to lose some of the... All right, I mean, that's... That's a good time to call it, I think. Bust that down a little bit. Now I want to switch to a freehand billet. And work right here in front of you. Um, that was a good one. Lost piece of a piece of it, but a lot of that ran right across. That was a good one. Another nice flake there. And, oh, see, I don't have a good squatting genetic, as you can see, so I'm going to stop doing that for a minute. Just by facing through this piece, so see, we're just kind of got a nice little by face going. And uh, just showing you a little bit of progression, still working. On oh, thinning it there we oh man that was a beauty that one that was a good one there that was a very good one freehand antler percussion beauty glad I pretty much just turned the camera on just in time to catch that one Let's try to take another good one here there we go that's a good one too See what we got here. We ran all the broken half. All right. Nice flake removal. We're just thinning this out. 
That's really all we're doing. Remember with a with one of these knives is we don't really want to get it paper thin either because then it won't it won't withstand some of the abuse that we're going to get it. But if it's too thick, it's not going to really be able to get into some of the places that we need it to get into when we're trying to cut stuff. So it's kind of a happy medium there or you know, kind of make whatever you can to the best of your ability and when you get to a point when you're making blades that are too thin, you'll know because you'll just snap them. Ooh, oh, oh. Man, that's a nice little one. Look at that. Love that. Love that free hand. If you haven't seen that other video that I did on that, make sure you go find it. It's like the, um, the Abo napping tutorial that I did. It's kind of like a starters for Abo Napping where I really talk about these freehand pieces because I'm just getting just gorgeous uh, long flakes with these little stubby antler billets. That's where I'm going to kick my leg up here and use the back of my antler tine, not the front, not the pointy end, but the back of it to, to brush or grind that off just a little bit. So I can get a little bit better platform. Like that. Ooh, there we go. Ran pretty much eh, about three quarters of the way across. So, good stuff. Good stuff. But we're getting there. You can see we're getting right into there. That biface shape, you can see we're, we're starting to take a little bit of mass off of it anyway, which is good. One of the things to keep in mind with a knife, and this is a little bit of explanation for some of your, your earlier larger points that maybe aren't as well done, they're a little bit more crude, is we need to, you can kind of remember as you use a knife and you sharpen it down, you're actually going to be pressure flaking, sometimes even indirect percussion flaking, and driving flakes more because you're sharpening the edge. So if you have something like, say, kind of over here in the middle. So this is a is an. I wish I kind of had this to show you earlier because I actually had like a kind of a turtle back. Where was it? It was right here. There was a turtle back on this blade at one point right here, and it's not there anymore because as I started sharpening it down, I got to a point where if I would have just continued to work it down to get to that turtle back, then I would have been left with a very small blade. But the reality is because I left the turtle back there and my blade was wider, it never interfered with what I was working with. But then whenever I got to a point where I chipped it down, I got to a point where I had a nice platform and I was able to drive that little turtle back off. And so the reason I say that is you're going to see stuff that's like there's a little bit of a, of a hinge step fracture there. There's a little bit of a turtle back here. I may still get that out, but I may not. And that's not super important. So when you start finding maybe some of these bigger pieces, like this would just be a biface. Somebody finds this, it's a non-diagnostic biface, meaning it has no traits to say what time period it's, it's from. Um, there's no hafting area, anything like that. It's simply just a bifaced preform. But when you find some of these larger pieces that maybe have some imperfections, that's another great indicator that it's more so used as a tool or a knife blade rather than a projectile because we don't have to get it perfect. Like there, if there's a big step fracture or a hinge, it's going to stop penetration. If this was a projectile point, it's not a projectile point. So there's no sense wasting the material if you understand what I'm trying to say. So we can work through that later as we sharpen the point down. If it becomes a problem later as the blade gets smaller, then that's when we're going to take it down. So, just because you have a piece and it's not a gorgeous made piece, it doesn't mean that it wasn't a really useful tool. But chances are, if you have a, a piece that's got like a giant, like ridiculous turtle back or step fracture, it probably was not a projectile point, simply because that would be a point of resistance that would hin hinder penetration. I got a nice, nice spot here, really. There we got it. 
but I just blew it to pieces. But man, that was a really nice one. Hmm, not so good. You can hear some of the dull, clunky stuff when you hit it. It's saying that you're not, it's not a good solid. You hear it, there's a ting versus a clunk, and that clunk is usually not a good indicator for a solid platform. It's got a little higher ting to it, so that way when it comes off, we know, there we go, it's going to be a nice flake. That was more of a clunk, and what it did was it went in here and step fractured. So you can actually play a lot of this napping game by listening to your flakes as well. Beauty. Very nice. Very, 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 very nice. All right, now we're getting to a point where this is where you could get greedy on that. Like I said, about being a knife blade. You see this hinge? That's where I had that clunky sound. Oh, never mind. I was able to pop it off, so completely disregard everything I said or was going to say. Um, I'm going to open this up just a little bit here and back brush this down. But otherwise, it, it's a... Uh, that would have been one of those points where it would have been okay to leave that because it wasn't going to interfere with the tool being used as a knife blade. And and now what we're what we're going to start doing is starting showing a little bit more of some of the Daltonish features, and that's where we start to concave the base of the point. And there's a reason for that as well, and, and you'll understand that more if you don't know what that is already from some of my other videos you'll understand more when we get to attaching it to the handle. All right, kind of have this one, this one big ugly turtle back that's right here, which I'm not, I wouldn't be concerned about it, except that it's right in our hafting area. So I'm going to try one, one good pass to take it off. And so far, no good. Oh, you know what? I got a good chunk of it there. So that's good. That makes me feel a little bit better. So then let's go ahead and do this. Let's start working this hafting area down. So we don't need all of that material. So I'll use that to build a platform. You can see what it did right there. Now it's actually looking very um, kind of Simpson-ish for a point. That's all these paleo style or transitional paleo points. And that just raised my platform go. Knocking her off there. Much, much better. Much better. And that one's not going to give give it up quite that easily yet, though. So it is kind of interesting that this, this point is naturally, it's taking on more of a Simpson style of Paleo Florida point than it is a... Uh, a Dalton, but we're still going to use a lot of that same concave base technology. Like, I don't care that much about replicating a very specific type of point. What I'm trying to do is, is create the best piece out of the rock that I can for the job that I'm trying to create. And we're getting pretty darn close to it. So that's what I'm talking about, kind of being bull tongue-ish, and that is that it's thinner at the bottom and you have more of a round, and this does come to a little bit more of a point, but a lot of times your bull tongue stuff is, is just very, very wide overall. And that doesn't make a very good projectile point at all. That really, really makes a great knife, a great knife. Very good. All right. Tell you what, I think for our basic percussion, we are just about finished. Might, might try to get one more right there. Pretty good overall. A little quick cleanup. We we'll move into the next stage on this piece because it's it's really coming out quite nice. All right, so now we're ready to get back into uh, some indirect percussion. And what's 
interesting. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do it like this is you can see when I was sitting in a chair before and holding my indirect percussion stick, which is just this here, and it's tucked up under my leg. I'm sitting in a chair, which which is fine and it works great. And probably not terribly anthropologically correct, but squatting more like this certainly is. And what's interesting about it is, of course, just like working in a chair anyway, is I can actually move this thing aside and I can continue to be here and do my, uh, that was a nice little flake, do my percussion napping. I mean, I can even get some really nice hits um, with this thing just tucked up out of the way. And then when I need it, I can swing it back in and use it. So just because I've switched to this doesn't mean that I don't, I don't do anything except this. I can switch back and forth. And then of course I'll have my uh, antler tine that I will still brush with. And I can do all of this stuff and I never have to move. So like I said, this is probably just a little bit more correct for the stance in using a tool like this rather than sitting in a chair. And so we're just set that right up on a platform that we want. And then this is where either having a bone or um, just another antler billet, one that I don't normally use that much, I can use for this. And I can knock some really nice indirect percussion flakes off with this moose antler um, indirect percussion stick, which of course you can get those at my website as well. But, and you'll find that, I know I've mentioned that before, is normal deer antler, I typically just break deer antler really fast. Moose antler is so much tougher. Now, you could say, well, what, Ryan, what did they do in the instances of places where, say, moose didn't live? Well, you can use deer antler, but you're going to have to hunt around and you're going to have to find those absolutely perfect pieces that have no pith on the inside because if it has pith that means it's relatively weak just like when we're building these indirect percussion uh, billets or not indirect these direct percussion freehand billets if it's got pith in it I don't want it so that I, I'll use that for something else but the napping tools I don't want any pith at all and then if you're talking about paleo times and even into archaic times when they probably still had some salvage ability for ivory because ivory is exceptionally tough. Moose antler is the closest thing that I have personally found to the strength of ivory and it's still not as strong as ivory and I do have some mammoth ivory that I've been playing with quite a bit that was taken out of the permafrost in Alaska. So I've done some pretty neat stuff with that and I've got a little bit more neat stuff coming up too so um, hang with me on some of that cool uh, ivory work but anyway I just told you all that to basically just tell you if you make one of these at home and you just use any normal random deer tine you may find that it snaps too easy or it'll chip like you could literally chip a huge chunk off that's usually what happens if I just use whitetail antler but the moose antler I'm not saying you'll never break it but if you set your platform up well and you don't beat the crap out of it, you'll get a lot of use out of that moose antler. And you just get these phenomenal flakes that you couldn't get with pressure flaking. And you'd be hard pressed to get them with percussion because they're in a little bit too tight but you'll get them really good with this indirect percussion, like really good. And I know you're not really seeing probably many of the flakes that are coming off. Pretty much every single one of these hits is throwing a flake off. I don't know if y'all can see them or not. I mean, they come off pretty, pretty hard. Pretty good. So now we're actually getting down here. Really, our piece is looking quite nice for a knife blade. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm not worried about trying to finish this thing off to be this, this gorgeous point piece to go into a display case. 
just don't want to kill it with detail. Now we can start using the tine end to actually remove some very strategic little flakes. getting ourselves right into a position to start creating the edge of this blade. Getting right down to this side. You can see how the edge is a little bit more fine. And remember we talked about before about having like a, I mean it's not a big issue. It just looks, it almost looks like a big giant flute, but that's just a natural piece from spalling the rock. And that we left it but this is our side you can see that the edge is a little bit more refined right it's not quite as rough and jagged so this side is actually done at least as far as a knife blade for what we're concerned and I can sharpen it out a little bit more if I want to do some flesh work but it's actually quite sharp the way it is so I'm not gonna push it I like it in fact I may I may come in and just take a few more out I'll feel the edge right here is nice and sharp you can see it's got a couple serrations and I'll probably sharpen just a tad right there and then up at the tip it's actually sharp too but I won't even do that till it's in the knife and then on this side you can see how it's not it's you can just see this side's a little bit more cleaned up than this side here so that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean this side up to match and then we're gonna do ahead go ahead and do the base of this and then we can move on to putting in the handle well unfortunately pop the ear off the bottom of that. It really does have a, a very interesting Simpson-ish <laughs> look to it, doesn't it? But I popped the ear off of this side right here on accident while setting up a platform because you can see there's a little bit of a turtle back kind of right here. This is actually the, the point where I'm essentially going to have to almost somewhat flute it right here because I have a high spot and I could work around it but I, I have a pretty confident that I can get that off but I was setting that platform up and wasn't really paying attention ended up popping that off but that's not the end of the world I'm not gonna let that broken ear dictate the success of this knife blade at the end of the day it's a knife blade even if I knock the other one off but in all honesty I'm just looking for a hafting area I'm gonna put this on to remove material. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up a little bit of a platform. To try to drive. It still doesn't want to come off. That's the problem I'm running with here. Set it up just a, just a little bit more. But having that concave base is a very good thing. And I'm going to explain why. So that's why I'm so very interested in, in getting this piece off. Because it's just going to help us later in, in hafting. Because believe it or not, removing stone is actually easier than removing wood. Let's see, right about there. There we go. Certainly didn't get all of it, but I kind of almost shot a little flute up it. You see it? That's what I was essentially trying to do. And that's not too bad. I'm going to try to get one more little piece right there. So, did I screw up and bust the ear off? Yes, I sure did. But, it's not going to change the functionality of the blade in itself. Because when it comes to hafting a knife blade, pretty much the glue is doing all the work. So when we glue this into a handle, the, the glue is going to be really what's holding it in. Any of the bindings that we're going to use basically add a little bit of secure to it because it does shrink down. But then if we break the glue loose and we're not paying attention, we're not walking along and accidentally lose the blade. That's essentially what the sin used for. But uh, I think we're at a point right now on this that was actually turning into a pretty nice <laughs> Simpson point until I busted the, 
the base off, and I'm a little, still a little bit butthurt about it, honestly. Clean that up just a, a little bit more. But like I said, if <clears throat> we would be down to, to two to two points on this, okay? If we're gonna use this as a knife, then we can either haft it the way it is and not care or if we want to let our OCD and perfectionism, which I struggle with a lot, I love things to be correct, not have this little ear on here means nothing for the capabilities of this piece being a good, not only a functional, but a good knife. So I can't let that stop me. So when you may find an artifact that is actually a quite nice artifact and there's just a piece broke off like that. I mean, obviously it happened on accident, but it doesn't mean that it happened after it was used. Because in this situation, we're broke. And if you would look at this, you can see where it actually snapped off. I don't know if you'll actually be able to see it or not. Let me hold it up here. Let's camera focus on it. You can see where it snapped off and actually drove a flake down here. So it, it looks like, oh, it was dropped, or it happened in the haft, or something. It happened during the manufacturing process. But I'm going to use the thing anyway. So, really what I'm going to do is, now I'm going to come back here. I don't need this, but it's going to help the haft. So I'm going to doll this up. Doll the hafting area. And we're going to go ahead and get a handle together. And we're going to basically have ourselves a bison skinner. Now, remember the shape difference that we're really looking at here. As you can see that this one's much more bull tongue. It's wider. And this one started off very similar to this one. Very similar. But over a period of time, when you start chipping down this edge, trying to resharpen it, which you're going to see here in a minute, that is how you end up with something that's more straight edged and streamlined. And then once we do get to a point where we've exhausted this down to to where there is really, it's too thin, it's too small, I'm not going to get a great knife, knife blade out of it. I would take this out of the haft, sharpen it up, and use it as a projectile point because essentially it's already really well suited for that. But there's still plenty of life left in this. I'm not ready to take it out and discard it yet. Now, if I needed a projectile point and I made a brand new blade just like I did now, there would be nothing in realistic terms in, in, in prehistory that would say, cool, I just made a new blade. Let me go ahead and heat this and take this out. I'm going to use this as a projectile and I'm going to put this blade into this handle because the work is already done. The handle is already notched, but if I do that, which would be anthropologically correct, I'm not teaching you how to cut out the handle. <laughs> so, realistically, had I had this knife, this would now probably, for me, turn into a projectile point, and I would be replacing the blade with this one, and we would live happily ever after, but we're not going to do that because, quite honestly, Maybe this knife still has use, but I need a knife for somebody else, for another person in my tribe. And so we're going to build a whole new knife without disassembling this one. That's what we're doing right now. All right, first thing that we are going to do is we're going to sharpen this bison skinner because we're going to use this one in aiding the making of the next handle. So what I'm doing is just removing a series of flakes to expose new rock. Now, like I said, this started off much larger at one point, but every time that you want to expose new rock, you're making the blade slightly smaller. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. That's just what happens when you're trying to sharpen your blade. Now, you can sharpen these things really about dozens of times. And I have sharpened this piece over and over and over again. And I'm just sharpening it yet again. And you don't always have to sharpen both sides. Sometimes just one side is sufficient. And that's also sometimes how you end up with these single beveled points or blades is they're only sharpened on the one side and then they're flipped over and they're sharpened. I'm not a big fan of the single beveled stuff, 
So a lot of times whenever I sharpen, if I start to create a bevel on one side, I flip it over and actually intentionally remove material from the other side because I don't really like the bevel for the work that I'm doing. So I intentionally erase the bevel, you know, about every other time that I sharpen. But that doesn't mean that other people do or other people did in history because there's a lot of points and blades that are beveled. So we're now to a point where we've got enough of a fresh edge. In fact, I'm going to just maybe a teeny tiny bit more. And I'm not looking for a super fine serrated edge like I am on a projectile point because I'll break all those little serrations off. But on a blade like this, that's going to be absolutely perfect. We'll be able to go ahead and work on our wood projects from here. I jammed a nice little flake right in my finger. It stings now. So we got our blade like that. And you can see a concave base that we've got going on here. And interesting little flute. And so what we do is have a piece that we've cut off just like this. So I got a, a nice little piece of cherry wood that uh, I really like this stuff. It's just, it's kind of pretty to look at. I like the bark and stuff on it. So, and it's a good diameter. This is actually dried and it's seasoned already. So I just cut a whole bunch of this kind of stuff. So I'm going to cut and we're going to haft it right into that. So now we're going to move on. I'll show you how to kind of process that off, but it'll be the same, same way for cutting this side, obviously, as it is the side that we want. And I'm just going to hold this up and just choose how long I kind of want the handle to be right about there. Good enough. Keep my thumb on that. I'll take the bison skinner and I'll just score it. And that marks it. And then I'm going to bring the camera in close, really close, so you can see what we're doing again. That's that was our score line. And now what I usually do is I don't I sometimes you'll you definitely see me saw like this depends on how the blade wants to work I'm not opposed to doing that but a lot of times especially when I'm just scoring all the way around it's interesting you can kind of see how sharp that this actually so here's a bare piece of the wood right and I set it on one scrape and we've already got a pretty good score line so what we're gonna do is kind of score this all the way around Till our lines meet up. Just like that. So now we are looking at this. Now we are looking at this uh, having a score line all the way around. And this is the side we're going to use for a handle. Now at this point, since this is our handle side, we'll hang on to that so it's easier to remember. And we want it to break off a little bit flush. So we'll score this in about as far as the knife blade will allow us to go. So if you do have a thinner knife, it's going to allow you to score in a little bit deeper. All right, now we can, we can take and we can actually cut this, like if this is our handle, we can cut in from this side and at an angle to meet this, which actually works really, really well. If you haven't seen me do that in another video, you will. But since I have a little bit of a hand axe, it's, it's kind of nice. I'm gonna lean on this and I'm just gonna chop that out instead. But you gotta be careful because you don't really wanna chop your, your handle side up. This way, you can just kind of remove it a little bit faster. And the reason we want to do this is because we're trying to make a recess that the tool that our, our knife can actually go down into a little bit more. So we run, there's too much friction on the side of the knife once you cut in so far, and it no longer cuts efficiently. And so what we're trying to do is create a little bit of a recess so we can get the knife in there a little bit further. 
probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you now, but whenever you try it, you'll understand. So then what we can do is the same thing. We can just go ahead and take and recut in a new line. And if you got any place that you can literally just saw this, any of those chop marks, you can just saw them right down. So I guess what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to get you in close so you can really see what I'm what I'm doing here because it's really efficient work. So hang with me one sec. It's definitely a little bit easier on a rock than my leg, but I wanted to show you how we're coming in at an angle. And we can just saw all this material out of here. You can see how much material we're removing right down to our original line. And if you just start that with a chopping rock, you can finish it off with the with the knife blade. Now, if you don't have one of these, okay, if you're starting from scratch, absolute scratch, then take the blade that you just made. And you can do all the same work with it because you're essentially this is what you're making this for. So you can make the handle with nothing but the blade. So that's it. It's like you make a tool to do a job. It doesn't have the handle yet, but you can actually make the, the handle with the tool that you made to put on the handle. See what I mean? Just like that. And it works very, very well. The difference is it's not as comfortable to hang on to as one that you already have made. And that's why we put a handle on it to begin with, to make the job just a little bit easier. But you can use it as a hand knife without ever putting a handle on it to begin with, if you'd like. There we go. Right, you see what we've done there? Very nice. So this is the side that we're going to use as our handle. So we're just kind of basically making it to where we can break it off as a straight edge. But we don't, don't necessarily want to break it off. When we're just kind of rough cutting green wood, it's okay to score it and then snap it. But when we're using, trying to make a finished piece, if you snap it, you end up with a lot of kind of damaged fibers in the middle. And we don't really want that. So we'll spend a little bit of extra time to actually cut it off the right way. So you can see that, you know, a knife, a knife and a saw, pretty much one and the same in the primitive world. I made you kind of sit through it because I wanted you to see how how far we've actually gotten on that side. And it only takes a few minutes. It's all it takes. It's just a few minutes. It's not like it's an hour job to sit and use one of these stone knives because because when you sharpen them, they're actually quite sharp. And this is dry wood. This is not green wood. So green wood goes even faster. See, it's a great example right there. How much material we can remove with one of these knives. That's why these things are so valuable. Why do you think I use them all the time? They're such efficient little pieces. And then you've got two blades. So if you get a side that's starting to dull out, you switch to the other side. Hang with me here, just a couple more minutes. We're gonna be ready to snap that off. And 
Now we're close enough in the middle. We're not really going to damage the fibers when we break it. Boom. There we go. So how about that? That's perfect, right? So we don't need that piece. This is going to be our handle. Now what we can do is go ahead and take your bison skinner. Just clean that little tip right off. You can flatten this thing out on a rock. You can use this. This removes material really, really well. I almost use it like a wood rasp sometimes where I'm not in a straight line. I'm just, I'm almost covering. I'm not only going this way, but I'm also kind of going up and down at the same time. And I'm quite literally using it as a rasp. And once you get it to that point, actually cleans off pretty nice. See, just like that side. This side I ground off on a rock a little bit like that, which that doesn't take much time to do either. But, so there you go. That's how you're going to cut that. Now let's go ahead and let's cut the groove so we can set our knife blade into this piece. All right, so now when it comes to put in the groove, I like to look for usually your piece of wood is a little bit more oval. It's not used a lot of times, you know, they can be perfectly round, it's fine. And if if your piece is a little bit more elliptical like mine, like it's a little wider this way, then I'll just compare it to my blade and say which way is it going to fit a little bit better? And in this case, I want the more the wide side to be where the uh, groove is going to be. So I'll look at where that's going to be, and I'm just going to score a little line on each side so I know. That's just a good starting point. And then it's going to be the same thing that we just did, and we may even go back and sharpen this blade. And another little tip that I should have pointed out, but I didn't because I kind of jumped the gun and I wanted to show you wringing it off first, is if you had left this on, you would have a longer piece to hang on to. <laughs> um, but like I said, I just jumped the gun. I was more focused on what I was going to show you on the video than what I normally do. And that is, you, you know, you have a longer piece. Well, this is a heck of a lot easier to hang on to and you can lean on it you're going to cut your groove so much easier if you leave it long ahead of time. But of course, I did the bonehead thing and I did the order of operations backwards. So here I am with a little stubby piece I have to hang on to. And it's not the end of the world. It still works. I'm just saying practicality. Go ahead, cut your, your point uh, or your blade groove in first. And what we're going to do is we're going to start on one side and we're working the knife back and forth like this. Not always down in the bottom, but sometimes up on the sides. Remember, like I said, like a wood rasp? So I'll do that all the way up and down because remember, we have to have a little bit of room to actually get this blade into this once we get into here a little bit further. Now, how long have I just been doing this? Um, not very long. I mean, what am I only 15? I'm um, more than 15 seconds in, but 30 seconds of grinding, 40 seconds of grinding, even maybe a minute. With one of these flint knives. Let's look and see how far I am already. Can you see that? Look how far that is. I'm just about to a halfway point in here and that far. So that's how fast this work actually happens. Stone Age work doesn't have to mean spending hours and hours and hours and hours to accomplish a goal once you have the right tools and that's why it helps to have the handle because if we were just using this we couldn't put the same force on it we would have to go a little bit lighter and it still works but that's again that's why we put a handle on this as opposed to just always using a hand knife because the handle allows us to have some leverage and some comfort and we can bury it in our palm like this while we're pushing and so now we're not just holding it like this and working because that's not as efficient as, as you think it works around your hand but you bury this that's why the handles are relatively short it's so important to tell you that because a lot of times you might say well i'm going to make a longer handle on mine 
but the handles are a little bit short on this because you're going to bury it in your palm. And I guess sometimes I forget to tell people this stuff, but this is what's really, really important about this is I'm going to bury it. See, I can hold it with my finger uh, here. Man, I'm doing everything in reverse on the camera, but I can hold it there with my finger and I bury it in my palm. So a lot of times when I'm working this, again, it's buried in my palm. So now it's in a straight line with my arm or almost straight line and I can add a lot more stroke as opposed to if I was holding it like this working it's much more awkward so that's why you're gonna cut the handle a little bit shorter so hopefully that makes sense to you all why these actually have a slightly shorter handle than say like a modern knife that you don't work like this this is we use this in a sawing matter manner oh so so often so now what we can do is we're gonna flip it over we'll go ahead and do the other side and our groove is off just ever so slightly. So I'll true that up. That side's feeling a little bit dull to me, so I'll switch sides of my blade. That's, that's a little sharper. That's why it's nice to have two cutting edges. So as one starts to feel dull, switch. Twice the work and with, between having to stop and sharpen. And really coming together pretty well here so you can see this is the side we did first and how far we are in on it and so you can see the plan of attack that it's like I'm almost working at a triangle so it's deeper in the middle but now I don't have to sharpen this again I'll get through this the rest of the way but what I'm going to do is because I can tell that it's getting dull and remember last time I, I know I sharpened it the other way so I'm going to set it down and I'm just going to do a, a little liven, livening up of the edge. Not necessarily a full sharpen but I'm going to come in and I'm going to knock the high points down so like the little tops of the serrations that I had before I'm going to use those as platforms to drive a couple flakes off so I have an, a little bit of a new fresh edge. Because if we're trying to be efficient, there's two different ways to be efficient. One is to save our tool and use it dull about as long as we can. And the other method of efficiency is to make the tool as sharp as we can and not worry about the life of the rock so we can accomplish the job that we want to. So you're going to have to make that decision for yourself. Would you rather your tool last longer or would you rather get the job done faster? Because it's a trade-off. And you're just going to have to make that call for yourself. And in this situation, I want to get the job done a little bit faster. And now my blade is sharp again. Now you'll notice once you start getting down to this point, I want you to look right in the middle. You have kind of like a peak. So you can see it's, it's chewed out on both sides, but it peaks up in the middle. So if we stick the blade in here, I think you'll be able to understand a little bit. See how it starts here and it gets deep and then it peaks right here because that's the direction of the blade that we followed. Same thing here. So we can't, we can't put it in yet, but I want you to understand some of the reasoning behind the concave base, especially in say like a Dalton point, especially, is it's gonna fit to where our ears can reach over the top and have a little bit more bite. See how that makes sense? And it'll, but we need to still sit this in a little bit further because what happens is right now it's still not a problem. I can get in here and we're gonna work all this down and we'll probably work it into about here. But once you get to that point where now the knife no longer really fits, like once you get down in here far enough, the knife no longer really fits and you're still going to have this peak, but the peak's going to be lower. And that is going to make up the difference of how this blade sits as opposed to on the inside of the groove, on the inside of it here, instead of it being perfectly flat all the way back to here, and then we're having a flat blade that sits in, which is which is 
we see that too with different things like uh, maybe a Dina's or something or not good Dina's a uh, Copina's um, on some of this early stuff we're gonna see more of a concave base that fits onto a peaked uh, ground out hafting groove so maybe that hopefully makes a little bit of sense to you as to why some of these points and blades have concave bases now you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about when you get to a point that your knife really no longer fits in here just really look at this a second so we're in here pretty darn far you can see how far we've come down actually a little bit further than I think it looks like on camera but you get to a point where see the knife the sides of the knife and everything they just don't really fit down in very well and once you do that you're going to understand perfectly you work it this way as much as you possibly can but if you keep making it wider this way see it won't fit the point very well we're already just a teeny tiny bit on the wide side it's not that bad but that's how that concaved base is going to fit down in there a little bit better and sometimes fits one way better than another looks to me like we could actually I think we can remove just a tiny bit more from the base of this point and it's going to benefit us it's easier you're going to notice you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about when you do it you get to a point where it's so much easier to simply remove a few flakes of stone from the base like this than it is to grind out the wood from our handle and it seems so silly to think about but you're gonna struggle getting that last little bit of wood out and the best thing you can do and that's why especially this is it's kind of weird it's almost like a like a, a Dalton Swanee or a Dalton Simpson mix it's kind of funny it just is what it is I just made a uh, a piece to do what I want with but it's so much easier to chip that out and let it slide over the top of it and we still have plenty of surface area to half the handle. you can see it's already got a fairly I mean I probably can't shake the crap out of it I mean no I definitely can't shake the crap out of it but I can wiggle it pretty good and the handle doesn't fall off so it's it's in there pretty hard as it is and so this is actually going to make a quite nice little knife cherry wood handle nice bull tongue and this again is kind of how they start out you know you want to make them to where they've got a lot more cutting surface because as you see how we sharpen it over a period of time you're going to get a little bit thinner and a little bit thinner and a little bit thinner and next thing you know it's going to look a lot more like this one instead of this one so now that we've got that going what we're going to do i've been chewing sinew which is deer tendon and I, and I got another piece over here in fact I'm gonna go ahead and start on it as well I'm gonna roll it a lot of times I roll it up if I'm talking especially and I'll just stick it in my cheek I suppose if it was a dip but I don't dip but and then I'll chew it a little bit later but now what we're gonna do is I have a little bit of fire going off to the side mostly it's just coals at this point and I'm just gonna heat it up I want to heat up the wood the hafting area because I don't want to shock it Okay, you can see a little bit of ember on there. And then I'm going to take my pine pitch and I'm going to heat that up as well. Whoops. Man, I have a habit of breaking that thing on camera. I'll reach off. And what I'm doing is I'm just coating this pine pitch glue in here really well. really get this stuff hot and it's just primitive hot melt glue made of pine pitch and charcoal and then you want to heat your the base your point just a little bit not a whole lot because again you don't want to shock it and then we're going to really kind of coat that together and this glue should all still be pretty hot together I'll set that aside and then figure out if there's a way it fits better one way or than the other and I think 
this way is the way that fits the best. And then I lick my finger so it doesn't stick to me quite as much. Even though it is sticking a little bit. And I really cram that in to that hat. And you can't do that if your finger's wet because it'll stick, to, or if it's not wet because the pitch will stick to you. Then if you need more, you know, just heat up a little bit more pitch. Keep wiping it up, but, but you are a little bit against the clock because this stuff is, is essentially hot glue. I mean, you feel free to make a mess of it. I oftentimes do. Really wet your fingers up. And you know what I'm talking about. If you use this stuff and you don't wet your fingers, it's going to stick to you and you'll never be able to really pack it. That's the important part in this is you want to be able to pack this wet glue into any bit of airspace that's in there before it dries. See how it sticks to you? So you lick your fingers or you put a little charcoal on them or something to create a barrier. And it won't seem like it's a very tight fit at first. It's going to seem like it's kind of loose. I'm telling you, once this stuff dries, and that's another fact too, I didn't do it on this one just because it's it's not super necessary. You can see on this one here, kind of ground down a little bit. In fact, let me adjust the camera. Just, again, it's getting dark on us here. There you go. You can see the shoulders of this are a little bit more beveled in, and that's not a bad idea. And I didn't do it on this one because they weren't real bad, but you can see how these are, I mean, if this was a point on a spear shaft, that's the worst thing ever because it would stop all your penetration. But I don't really care on the handle of a knife. That doesn't bother me in the least. But once it's actually on here and it's dry, if you want to take this, don't come in it from this way, but you're going to come in from this side. You can do this ahead of time too, but it's it literally takes like three minutes. I'll just do one side here and then the other side I'll do off camera. If I ain't holding on to the blade, it might, if it's not dry enough, it might still work around on you. But you'll see what I'm talking about. And it's not necessary, I just figured I'd show you how to kind of do it easy, easy peasy. Because there for a while I was taking it like on the end of a rock and I was just grinding it and grinding it. And it actually takes a, a fair amount of time to grind rock off as opposed to using a, a flint knife like this as a... As like a wood rasp. And see what we did there? So we took kind of the 90 degree off and we just kind of rounded it a little bit. And it's, it's really just, it's not even super important, but if you want to do it, that's how you're going to do that. Take that sinew that I was chewing on. Don't lay it in the dirt or on your pants where you're going to have a lot of dirt. Especially because if you decide you're going to chew it again, it'll certainly make a mess. I was chewing two pieces, I might only need one. Now this isn't super important. It's not, like, it's actually strong enough the the, the pitch will hold it in on itself, but the little extra binding actually helps with the sinew, which is, again, it's deer tendons, or any sort of animal tendons, but this is from a deer. And you can get the, obviously too, by the way, you can get the pitch and the sinew on my website huntprimitive.com so you just go there and look under the supplies tab and you'll find it but we're gonna pull it you don't have to pull it super tight but I like to kind of bind it out pretty tight because it'll shrink on its own and hold itself into place now you just kind of ring it over a little bit like that no problem and then once that dries, let's see it holds itself down. It's got these natural glues, but that's your bison skinner right there. Now, when you get one like from my website, they don't look exactly like this. They're a little bit different because like I said, this one was a little bit more Simpson bull tongue-ish, which doesn't hurt my feelings either. I don't care. I'm just going to take this thing out and use the dang thing. When you get it, it's going to look a little bit more Dalton-ish most likely on the sides, but you're gonna see pictures on my website anyway. Either way, it doesn't matter. It just, this is the way this one turned out and I thought it turned out quite nice. So, uh, 
that's pretty much your finished product. So this is now a new serviceable tool. Now, also, once it's dry, let me go ahead. It's Boy, it's getting dark on us pretty quick, isn't it? So once it's dry, once it's dry, then what we can actually do is take a little bit more of our pine pitch and just gently heat. You don't want to melt the pitch that's already here. It will soften up a little bit, but just gently heat it. Sometimes you can lay it in the sun, but you got to kind of watch it because if you lay it in the sun too long, it'll melt the pitch. But you can gently heat it around a fire just to where this gets warm. And then you take a little bit more pitch and you warm it and you can smear it right over top. And I can't do it now because it's wet. But if you smear it right over top of, like you can see it on this one, what it's going to do is it's going to help waterproof some of this. So if you're using it on animals or anything like that, you don't end up lifting the end. Because if you get this stuff really wet, it's it'll just soften back up and you'll lift up like one of these corner edges like this. And then it's just annoying because then it wants to unravel. So hey, now we got to re-wet it and put it back down. So what you're going to want to do is once it's dry, set it you know out a little bit, put a little bit of pitch glue. Now if you have hide glue, you can use that too. I'm not a big hide glue person. I mostly likely most most like to use pitch glue. So I'll just coat my sinew in pitch glue and we are good to go. So there we go. Thanks for following along. We'll catch you on the next adventure. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already and I hope you enjoyed our bison skinner knife build.